I'd like to start this video by stating that I fully expect to lose some subscribers with this one. This often happens when I challenge ideas that people want to believe. But that's okay. I don't have anything to sell, and I don't make any money on advertisements. I have, however, allowed others to post my videos in the hopes of reaching a wider audience. So if you are watching on another channel, and you don't want to be bombarded with ads, then please consider coming over to my channel and subscribing. If you are watching from my channel and you see an ad, please let me know because I don't want anybody but you to benefit from my work. So all that said, I've been growing increasingly frustrated with the untrue and partially true information being used by those with Precious Petals products to sell. I am passionate about wealth preservation, privacy, and freedom, and will to the best of my ability challenge some of the messages that you will hear as a member of this community. So if you are up for it, please continue to watch. I'm more than willing to have conversations in the comments section whether you agree with the material or disagree with it. We are all here to learn from each other, and that, more than anything else, is why I feel blessed to have attracted the subscriber base that I have. So for those of you who have been with me for a while, please let me say thank you. I have truly enjoyed the past few years as a result of your thoughtful participation. So let's get into it. Lately I've been hearing the ratio 9 to 1 a lot. The line of reasoning goes like this. There are only 9 ounces of silver produced for every 1 ounce of gold. Therefore, the correct price ratio between gold and silver should be 9 to 1. Thus, even if the price of gold doesn't change, the price of silver should be at least $100 an ounce, if not higher. On the surface, this sounds like a reasonable argument. I checked into the production statistics, and sure enough, currently only 9 ounces of silver are produced for every 1 ounce of gold. But as is always the case, an informed saver needs to check the details, especially if the surface message is presented in such a way that it appears to be a no-brainer, and doubly so if the message is presented by people who have something to sell. In this video, I'm going to present the data as well as my analysis of it. The data is quite real. It comes from the historic records of the U.S. Bureau of Mines, the U.S. Geologic Survey, the World Gold Council, and the Silver Institute. I believe this data to be sound and reliable. You can choose to believe it or not. I won't take any offense. But if you do disagree with it, then I would ask what alternatives you have for making your decisions and how you will know that you can trust the 9 to 1 production ratio supported by the data and not the rest of it. The analysis also uses old reliable geologic modeling used by Marion Hubbard. If you are unfamiliar with Hubbard linearization, I'd encourage you to review my past videos where I discuss Hubbard's techniques. You might also read some of his papers and his con congressional testimony in the 1970s. That said, let's get to the meat of this presentation. Let's start by taking a look at the historic record of ounces of silver mined worldwide for every ounce of gold. The data I am plotting goes back to 1940 and extends to the present. I'm showing data from 1940 onward because about 80% of the gold and silver ever mined has been produced in the past 75 years. What we can immediately see is that in the past few years, the ratio of silver production to gold production has hovered just shy of 9 to 1, which I highlight with a black line. So the statement that only 9 ounces of silver is produced for every 1 ounce of gold is an accurate one. What we can also see from this chart is that the ratio of silver production to gold production has been less than 9 to 1 for the past 75 years. And this is something that you don't hear mentioned when the 9 to 1 ratio is used as a justification for why the ratio of the gold price to the silver price should be 9 to 1. The production ratio was 9 to 1 in 1979 and also in 1943, but for the rest of the time the production ratio was considerably less than 9 to 1. In fact, there were times when the production ratio was as low as 5 to 1. And if we simply eyeball the plot of production ratio of silver to gold, we can see that for the past 75 years, the rate of production of silver relative to gold has been gradually increasing, albeit in fits and starts. And we'll analyze the trend with more rigor in a moment. Given that there was uh, such variability in the production rates of silver relative to gold, one can naturally ask 
whether or not the price ratio of gold to silver had anything to do with the production ratio. After all, if a 9 to 1 production ratio means that the price of gold should be no more than 9 times that of silver, then one would suspect that we could see a pattern if we take a look at the yearly average gold to silver price ratio plotted against the production ratio. And let's take a look at the plot and see what kind of story it can tell us. To this plot, I've added the yearly average ratio of gold price to silver price. I've made this trend red and plotted it against the right-hand axis. Note that while the left axis is scaled from 0 to 15, the right axis is scaled from 0 to 90. This was necessary because although some argue that the price ratio and the production ratio should be the same, the market apparently does not agree. Additionally, the price ratio has certainly changed with much greater fluctuations than the production ratio. Both of the data sets appear to be trending upward, but with the price ratio it's a little bit harder to tell for sure due to its volatility. Only once in the past 75 years did the yearly average gold to silver price ratio even reach the classic 16 to 1 level, despite the fact that the production ratio never exceeded 9 to 1. So it's difficult for me to even say that the price ratio of 16 to 1 is the right level, much less 9 to 1. My own personal thought is that 16 to 1 was the number set by governments in the past who wanted to preserve a bimetallic money system. If production ratios were anywhere close to 16 to 1 at the time, when these ratios were established, then the only price ratio that would have worked would have been 16 to 1. Otherwise, the citizenry would have offered one coin for transactions and hoarded the more scarce metal, as often happened when production ratios strayed even a little bit from the officially set ratio. If governments around the world decide to reinstitute a bimetallic money system, then the price ratio of 9 to 1 or less would be required in order for it to work, though I doubt that a bimetallic money standard is a likely future scenario. But with that said, let's get back to the chart. So we've seen that in the past 75 years, only once did the price ratio reach 16 to 1, and it never even achieved 9 to 1, despite the production ratio remaining below 9 to 1 over that whole span of time. Does that mean that the price ratio can never reach 9 to 1? No, not at all. All it tells us is that there's no reason to believe that it must. So what is the right ratio? I don't personally know. While 16 to 1 or 9 to 1 certainly seems attractive to someone who would like to buy a little silver to get rich as a result, and while it can be very compelling in terms of a sales pitch for those who want to sell silver coins and tokens, the statistics show that for the past 75 years, the price ratio has spent about as much time above the 50 to 1 level as it has spent below it. In fact, even in the 1940s, the price ratio was quite high. So how do we know what the right ratio is? Is it 9 to 1? Is it 16 to 1? Is it 90 to 1? Is it 50 to 1? Or is it the ratio that I like to use, which is 63 to 1? Quite frankly, I don't know. I don't think anyone really does. Lots of pe people place their bets based upon their personal beliefs. But that's what makes for a market. But what if, as I show here with the addition of a red arrow, the price ratio is increasing along with the production ratio? albeit slowly and with great volatility. Then we'll want to analyze the production ratios with more rigor to see what the future might have in store. Let's do that now. I'm going to use some theory made popular by Marion Hubbard back in the 60s and 70s. The technique is called Hubbard linearization. It's a good way of analyzing production trends of finite resources such as oil, gold, and silver. The heart of Hubbard's technique is a long-known principle of production of geologic resources. When a non-renewable resource is put into production, the rate of production is at first slow, then it accelerates until a maximum rate of production is reached. Typically the maximum rate of production is reached when about half of the resource is exhausted. Then the rate of production begins to decline as each additional unit of resources requires more and more work to produce. In general, the production curve is bell-shaped. The total area under the curve is the total amount of resource in a particular deposit. These types of production curves are typical for oil wells, coal seams, metal ore mines, and other finite resources which do not renew. 
Hubbard's genius was in the recognition that this principle could be applied to groupings of oil wells and not just single deposits. His preliminary analysis was of all of the conventional oil wells in the U.S. Hubbard predicted the peak of the conventional U.S. oil production would be in the 1970s, and he was right. Of course, he did not foresee the shale boom, but we'll get to that in a moment. So let's go through an example of an application of Hubbard's technique to the world oil production, including non-conventional oil such as shale and tar sands. On the top graph is data plotting the fractional incremental production of oil versus the total produced to date. We can see a roughly linear decline, indicating that the world oil is following a typical bell-shaped growth curve. At the point in time when 800 billion barrels of oil had been produced throughout all of history, production levels were at about 24 billion barrels per year, or 3% of the cumulative. Recently, when 1,200 billion barrels of oil had been produced throughout all of history, production levels were about 30 billion barrels per year, or 2.5% of the cumulative amount. So, while we are currently producing more oil per year than in the past, the production rate is at a lower percentage of total cumulative production. This signifies that new, newly produced oil is more difficult to discover and produce. No surprise here. The bottom graph shows historic yearly oil production statistics, most of which is from the BP Statistical Review. Against the curve fit resulting from Hubbard's method, the past production is replicated fairly well. Not perfectly, but from a qualitative standpoint, it's good enough. It's interesting that Hubbard's method is predicting that oil production will peak within the next few years. It probably would have done so years ago if it had not been for the shale oil boom. But shale oil deposits are notoriously short-lived, and given that shale fields such as Eagle Ford and Marcellus are already in decline, it should not be surprising to think that at some point soon the growth rate of oil production might hit zero and then will begin to decline. Now, according to the historical record, 1,387 billion barrels have been produced throughout all of history. And according to the CIA World Factbook, world-proven oil reserves are currently at 1,662 uh, billion barrels. At the current production rate of a, roughly 33 billion barrels per year, it will be about four years until the amount of oil remaining in proven reserves is about equal to the amount that has been produced throughout history. Geologically, this is the point at which maximum production rates can be expected to be followed by a gradual decline. Remarkably, the peak resulting from the Hubbard linearization of production rate trends is only a few years from now. It will certainly be interesting seeing what will happen to the world economy if, production, if this prediction turns out to be true. Now, gold and silver, being finite resources themselves, lend themselves to the same kind of treatment. Let's see what happens when we analyze them using Hubbard's method. On the left-hand side of this slide, I show the regression work that I did with gold production data dating back to 1910. I used U.S. Bureau of Mines data to estimate world historic production before that time. The earlier data isn't as reliable as latter data, but it shouldn't impact the analysis significantly because almost 90% of global gold production has taken place since 1900. This should not be surprising since the advent of cheap and abundant oil made exploration and mining of gold multiples more efficient than it had been prior to that. As we can see, when we look at the rate of gold production relative to total historic cumulative production in the upper left-hand graph, we see a very different picture from the one that we saw for oil. Gold production rates are only declining very slowly relative to the total above ground stock. For the past century or so, the average rate of growth of the above ground stock has been between 1.8 and 2% per year. It's had its ups and downs, but has been remarkably stable and has not been declining. Contrary to reports of those who are claiming that we have reached peak gold, this graph is showing that we haven't. And this is depicted in the lower left hand graph, which shows how the regression matches past production rates and projects uh, production rates into the immediate future. Now, does it bother me that peak gold is a false story? Not in the least. Quite frankly, the fact that the growth rate in the above ground stock is remarkably consistent over time 
is a great comfort to me. It tells me the gold supply, regardless of price, is not going to expand quickly. And quite frankly, it can't due to its scarcity. This is one of the properties that makes for a good money, the fact that its supply cannot be increased quickly. The treatment of silver is shown on the right hand side of the slide. The upper right shows the rate of silver production relative to the total historic amount that has been mined. An immediate contrast can be drawn against gold. Whereas the production rate of gold has remained fairly stable at 1.8 to 2 percent of cumulative production per year, the production rate of silver relative to the historic mined silver has been increasing. When only 20 billion ounces of cumulative production had been hit, the rate of world mine production of silver was about 0.2 billion ounces per year, or roughly 1% of the total mine to date. Recently, we reached a point where about 45 billion ounces of silver had been produced throughout history. At this time, the yearly mine production was 0.8 billion ounces, which was about 1.8% of cumulative production. So silver, in contrast to gold, is actually growing in terms of mining abundance. We can see this on the chart in the lower right hand, which shows how the Hubbard curve fits past data and how it projects into the near future. Like gold, silver production is predicted to continue increasing. Unlike gold, the slope of production relative to above ground stocks is actually increasing over time. Now most are going to say that this is not an important factor because two thirds of silver mined is used in industry. So there are not 45 billion ounces of above ground stock. To which I reply, okay, let's divide all of the production statistics by three to only consider the third of the silver that is produced for investment and divide the total cumulative numbers by three to reflect the total amount of above ground stock instead of the total historic production. Does it change the shape of the curves? The answer is no. What we would be left with is an estimated above ground stock of roughly 15 billion ounces that is increasing at a rate of 1.8% per year and will be growing by 2.5% per year by the end of the next decade. Am I bothered by this? Not really. <laughs> I don't make my living selling, selling silver coins and medallions, nor is my future going to be impacted by the uh, sales pitches of those who do. But all joking aside, when we take a critical look at silver production statistics, we can see that not only is there no sign of peak silver, but that the rate at which the bullion investors need to absorb silver supply relative to gold supply, it must continue to increase if pricing pressure is not going to be put on silver. So how does all this relate to the production ratio of the two metals? Let's take a look. According to the Hubbard treatment of gold and silver production data, the average production ratio has been between 6.5 to 1 and 7 to 1 for most of the past century. Towards the end of the last century, the production ratio of silver to gold has been increasing. I'm guessing this has something to do with the fact that much of silver's supply comes from it being a byproduct metal of other mining production. Thus, as the production of other metals increases at a faster pace than gold, silver comes along for the ride. The Hubbard curve reflects this relative increase in silver production. Now, I fully agree that the production ratio of silver to gold is 9 to 1 at present, but as I've shown, it has been lower than 9 to 1 for the past 75 years, and it is increasing, not decreasing. I believe that this trend is likely to continue. This isn't necessarily a problem, but it does mean that someone is going to need to absorb the relative increase in supply. Maybe it will be industrial consumers. That's always a possibility. If not, then what will be needed is an increase in the audience of people who favor silver as a store of value to gold. Perhaps those who are selling silver coins and medallions can weave a compelling enough story to make that happen.